Dad, it's church time. Okay, bring the laptop out here. We'll uh, we'll watch it whilst on uh, whilst having a coffee if you want. No, we're actually leaving. Oh, is that this week? Yeah. Okay. Well, I tell you what, probably doesn't matter anyhow because people aren't going to expect us, are they? Until two or three minutes past ten. It's Newton family. Come on, let's get ready. Okay. Welcome to Beverly Baptist Church this Sunday morning. And my name is Stephen Newton and I have an assistant with me today. Hi, I'm Grace and I'll be helping out too. Okay, so this morning we're going to be, uh, we're going to be meeting with Jesus and we really hope that you, you, experience, that you experience God's presence with us. We're going to be doing that in many different ways. We're going to be hearing from some people. We're going to be... Um, we're going to meet with Ian and Julia, who are going to lead us through the through the worship, song worship that is. And Phil's going to come along later. Well, he's not going to come along. He's actually going to be presenting from his home, socially distanced. And he's, uh, he's going to open up the word to us. The children have their own activities. They've been sent out. But uh, we hope that you meet with Jesus through that time. I think we don't know what kind of uh, week people have had really, do we, you know? Um, we know what week we've had. Yeah, it was a really good one. Well, right, so, it wasn't as good as it can be. Yeah, fair enough, for, under the circumstances, yeah? Yeah. But some people could have had a good week, you know? Or a really bad week. Or they could have had a bad week, that's true, we just don't know. So perhaps before we start, before we start, perhaps we, we just have a bit of time where we, we just pause and allow the Holy Spirit to come and just... Uh, and just be with us before we start this service. So let's just pause for a second. Don't worry if the kids are running around and, uh, and there's a bit of noise. Just Let's just take a little bit of time to think about our week. And then I'll pray for us. Lord Jesus, we just pray for our community. Father, we ask that you would be with each and every one of us. We pray, Father, that you would meet with each and every person who's watching this right now, Lord, and that you would touch them in a very special way. <clears throat> Father, just come, bring your Holy Spirit now as we, as we look to praise you and learn through the different people who make up this service. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come be with us and that we might glorify your holy name and understand what it is to be a child of God. Father, we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Shall we go over to Ian and Julia? Okay, we're going to go over to Ian and Julia, who are going to lead us in our first block of worship songs. Good morning. Let's just collect our thoughts now and just gather together and, and worship the Lord together. Let's sing one and only.
choose to bow Though there's pain in the offering I lay it down Here in the conflict When doubt surrounds Though my soul is unraveling I choose to bow Our church is, uh, is busy, we have things going on even in this time and all of the things that we have going on you will see in the electronic um, um, newsletter we have called Buzz. If you haven't got the copy of Buzz then uh, let the office know and they will send you a copy out for you. In the meantime, what other notices do we have? Is there anything we've got to highlight in particular? There's prayer on Friday. Oh yeah, okay. So there's prayer Friday. Eight o'clock in the morning, it's on Zoom. Again, if you want to be part of that, you're welcome to be part of that. Just get in touch with the office and they'll send you a link for Zoom. And we like to celebrate in BBC, don't we? Every week we celebrate with the humble Crunchy. And what we like to do is we like to celebrate people's birthdays and people's uh, anniversaries by giving them a Crunchy as a way of celebrating and what are you 
I'm eating that on their behalf. Great. You might that might be socially distancing the crunchy from them, but we've got crunchy fairies who go round. Okay. So hide the evidence. So if it's your birthday, it's been your anniversary this week. Happy birthday, happy anniversary. We can send you a half-eaten crunchy if you want, or we'll try and find you a full one. But we, um, Grace, for that, I think you need to tell us something we need to be thankful. Tell people something we need to be thankful for. Well, schools might be reopening uh, for some years. I'm happy about that. Um, we've heard we've been enjoying baking and lots of crafty, um, creative things it's true. during this time. That's true. Yeah. Anything else? Anything that you've done today? I helped Pete and Kaz move house. That's correct. Okay, so yes, we've got a little bit of video about that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. So here's an answer to prayer for you. Pete um, is part of our men's group and Pete and Kaz were looking to move house just as COVID-19 um, um, meant that we went into a lockdown situation and their house move was put on hold. But as of today, and just so that you know, today is actually Friday. So Friday, uh, Pete and Kaz successfully moved. And though they did have some hassles, didn't they? They, uh, they their removal company, their removal company um, um, wouldn't take all the stuff from the house. So some folks mucked in with some masks on and some gloves. And we all got them moved, didn't we? Let's see some video from Pete, just on that. Yeah, just something to be thankful for. Despite having a big letdown by the removal guys, we managed to get all the help we need to finish the job off. Thanks to some great Christian guys and, you know, prayers that have definitely been, people have been praying for me. So just thank you all. Thanks. Here's the celebrating Pete and Kaz. Mmm. So this lockdown situation, it's not exactly the easiest, is it? No. I mean, there are um, much like probably the you know the uh, the early church were all in a lockdown situation in an, in the upper room, having meals brought to them, and probably scared of the outside world and things. Um, and so, for us, you know, um, we're in a family of four, and there's plenty of when you sometimes lockdown, you know. We might want some social distancing <coughs> from some of the people in the family, eh? But um, what about those who are lo on lockdown on their own? Oh, you're talking about Ina and Carolyn? Well, amongst others, yeah, we've got a bit of video, haven't we, from those two people. Um, let's see what lockdown's like for both of them. Lockdown. There's lots actually I really am appreciating about lockdown. I've been furloughed, which means I've been able to stop and to really um, step off the treadmill of, of running to keep up with myself. And um, yeah, I'm really appreciating being able to do some of the things that I don't normally get time to do. I've made myself continue to get up early. Uh, well, maybe it's not early, but get up. And um, I'm loving having the time to spend with friends first thing in the morning via the old internet and pray with different people at 7.30 in the morning on different days. And that's a real blessing to me, um, just having that good start to the day. And then I've, after that, I like to get a cup of coffee when it's really quiet and listen to Lectio 365, which is the 24-7 prayer app, which I just adore. And I would highly recommend to anyone if you want something to help you in your own um, time with God. And my garden, my garden is such a blessing. It's a joy. It's a joy just being able to go out in the garden and, and do things out there. And then um, a friend of mine's mum gifted me a bike part way through the lockdown. And I'm loving re-engaging with cycling. I used to cycle everywhere as a youngster and I have big plans um, and I'm getting further and further, but I'm, I've not done as much as I want to do yet. So I'm really enjoying that. And then um, the best, the best thing, the best joy of it all has been um, getting to know my neighbours. Oh, it's just a, a joy. I'm really enjoying getting to know some of my neighbours. And that is, is a brilliant gift 
uh, for this time and um, a real answer to prayer too and I pray that God will continue to build those relationships and then um, you know yeah there are horrible days and there are down days and there's blur days and they can be really difficult but um, the thing I think I probably miss the most is um, hugs from my brother and not seeing my brother and he would have come up a couple of times now and I've really missed that and then um, when I can't do something for mum and dad, can't help them, can't hug them, um, th those days I find difficult when they need a bit more support and I'm just not able to give it because of the situation. But I have so much to be thankful for. My name is Ina. I live alone. When I had a letter from the government and NHS advising me that I was high risk to the virus, I had to isolate for 12 weeks. I felt very anxious as to how I would cope. I have spent a good part of my life visiting elderly, lonely, sick people, trying to encourage and support where I was able, but not fully understanding how difficult it can be to be on your own, no visitors, no family and no friends. It is very hard. I have been described by some friends as a social butterfly. No going out, no close proximity with family and friends is hard. I kept myself busy by uh, talking to friends on the telephone, texting, baking, little gardening, jigsaws, but increasing at the same time my knowledge of modern technology and also learning to live one day at a time. I have been greatly encouraged by so many acts of kindness. Family live in Cheshire, so I'm unable to see them, but my church family have been wonderful, popping by to give a wave, having a long distance chat, taking me for a walk and doing shopping, etc, etc, and making sure that I have everything that I need. My favourite verse is to be still and know that I am God, to be anxious for nothing and he will supply all my needs. It would be good to pray for those people, wouldn't it? It would, yeah. And in fact, you, you know, we've got, as Ina said there, she's got people rallying around doing a shopping. It's a little bit different. She's quite independent and, um, and you've got other folks who are helping different people out, including Carolyn there, who's helping, getting to know her neighbours, whatever. Uh, we've got many people helping each other out. But I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll pray for folks, yeah? But before we do, what I think uh, would be good is like we've done in previous weeks, if you've got your phone and you're part of a WhatsApp group, or you've got people on your Facebook, or you've got, their, you've got um, your phone and you can text message from that, then perhaps it'd be a good idea if you just want to send a message to encourage folks, particularly if you know people who are struggling or particularly if you know people who are on their own, just to think about them. And while you're doing that, I'll pray for folks, shall I? Yeah. Lord, we just ask that you would come now and be with your people. Father, we ask that you would um, be, we, be with each and every person, Lord Jesus. We're all in this together, but that we're in different circumstances. And Lord, we just pray that if there are people out there that are struggling right now due to this situation that we're in, Lord Jesus, be with them. Let them know, Lord Jesus, that you are the Prince of Peace. And Lord Jesus, that you give to each and every one of us the comforter. So Father, I just pray that you would be with folks who are struggling and particularly folks, uh, folks who are on their own, Lord Jesus. I thank you for all those who are rallying round and getting people shopping and doing whatever is needed to do practically for those who have to self-isolate. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be with those folks who are on their own and maybe just a little bit bored, anxious, frustrated, whatever their feelings are, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. 
And now's the time really that the children will probably head off towards their activities. There's some things that have been prepared. You've got to stay a little bit because you're going to read the Bible passage for us, aren't you? Yeah. And shortly after that, uh, <coughs> Phil is going to come along and he's going to uh, give the, uh, the word, unpack uh, the Great Commission for us. Okay. So, let's head over uh, to, to Phil, but first, you're going to read the Bible for us. Before we continue, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but peace. It's good to remember that. Our reading today is from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Good morning, everybody. We've been looking over the past few weeks since Easter at the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. We've seen how his coming back to life opens up life-transforming experiences for Mary and for us. We've seen how this was the fulfilment of the scriptures as he explained to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, giving them a framework for, for understanding what was going on having their eyes opened to recognise him as he broke bread. We've seen how the presence of Jesus brings peace and hope and joy to the disciples gathered in the upper room. We've seen him meet graciously with Thomas in his doubt and with Peter in his denial as he restores and recommissions him. Why? What is the purpose of all of this? Well, this week and next, we begin to look forward. Because even, the, even if they didn't realise it at the time, everything that Jesus was doing in those encounters was preparing his followers for the time when he wouldn't be with them anymore. When they wouldn't be able to ask him questions to physically follow him, to observe how he interacted with people, what he did. When they would need to rely on their own experience, their own understanding of the scriptures, their own knowledge of his grace and love, with, of course, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, who was to come, that's the week after next. But for what purpose? What did Jesus expect them to do with this experience? What was to be their future? Well, that's the focus of our passage today. Become known as the Great Commission. Jesus commissions these disciples for a future, for a purpose. And the first thing we notice about what he says to them, which we could easily miss, because perhaps we take it for granted that this is the case, is that this group was intended to grow numerically. What they had seen, what Jesus had taught them, was not just for the eleven, not even just for the wider group of followers, 120 or so, who were gathered at Pentecost. It was all done with the intention that this would be a group that would grow. So say we can take that for granted. It, it, it's obvious on one level. If it wasn't the case, we wouldn't be here worshiping Jesus two thousand years later. The followers of Jesus would have gradually died. The movement would have fizzled out, like so many, and it would have become a footnote in the pages of history, if it was even remembered at all. 
But no, that wasn't the intention. Even though Jesus was leaving, his name, his mission, his people were to go on. And new people were to be brought into that community. And 2,000 years later, that is still the commission of God's people. The church is, the church always has been, hasn't always recognised it, but always has been and always will be a missionary movement. We don't exist just to support one another. We're not a support group, a self-help group, a social club. Like the first disciples with their interactions with Jesus, we don't share our experience of Jesus together just to encourage ourselves. We don't study the Bible together just so that we know a little bit more in our heads. We don't support and pray with one another just so that we can feel a bit more loved. We do all this in order to be better equipped to draw others to become disciples of Jesus. The church is always to be outward looking. Go into all the world and make disciples, says Jesus. Much has been made of this recently. Sometimes I think too much, actually. People have argued it means that, that we can't rely on people coming to us, that, that all missionary work, all engagement with those who are not yet believers must happen out there, that there's no place for what the theologians would call a tractional church. And there's some useful emphases there because some sections of the church have become entirely reliant on a tractional church and cultural changes mean that that does not work in the way it once did. But we can't go too far. The early followers of Jesus were hugely attractional because they were hugely attractive. People saw them. They saw how they lived. They saw the people that they were, the community that they were, and they wanted to find out more. And so it doesn't have to be about saying we go out to where people are at rather than inviting them into where we are. We should do both. But it's about the community of people that they are encountering, whether that's on our territory or theirs, for lack of a better way of putting it, being a community that is on a journey, that is on a journey of making disciples, that is moving, that is going where it needs to go in order to share Jesus with people. That is inviting people in, yes, but inviting people to join them on a journey of making new disciples. Not just to come into a static place and a static way of doing things. That's the sort of church I want us to be. And if I'm honest, we're not always. Our strong sense of community, of family, means that we over-prioritise our caring for one another and lose sight of our commission to make new disciples. And it's not just me that thinks so. You might remember if you watched last week's online service, Karen told us that part of the children's activities last week would be to compare the focus of the New Testament church with the focus of Beverly Baptist. And some of our young people identified among our weaknesses, telling others about Jesus, helping people outside the church. The leadership team have been talking about how we can make this real in this time of lockdown. Most of what we do has, of course, moved online. Indeed, much of wider society has moved online. The ways that we connect with people, the ways we do our shopping. And so that's where we feel we need to focus at this time. And we will be launching, hopefully this week, a prayer ministry to the wider community through Facebook, targeted to the needs that people have at this time, offering to pray for them and with them. A means, hopefully, of introducing them to an experience of Jesus, which can be the beginning of a walk of discipleship with him. Please do keep an, e an eye on your email this week for more details of what that involves. Because everything we do in church community, yes, it's valuable for our own benefit, but it ultimately only has its full value if people outside see it, are attracted to it, and through that are encouraged to become followers of Jesus. 
And that word followers is important. Jesus doesn't stop at indicating that the church is to grow in numbers, that new people are to come in. He gives an indication of what is subsequently to happen too, a process of spiritual growth. Go and make disciples, he says, not just converts, but disciples. The word means follower. This is not just a momentary decision. Imagine for a moment that we set out from my house to somewhere that I haven't been before. And so I say, I'll follow you. And I look and I see that you've gone down to the end of my road and you've turned right onto Norwood. And I say, OK. That's fine, I know where I'm going now. I'll leave it a few minutes and then I'll follow. So five minutes later, out I go. I turn right onto Norwood. But then I'm completely lost. Because you've long gone. I've set off in the right direction. I've made that first correct turning, that first correct decision. But then what? I need to keep following on a journey, in order to make sure that I'm still going the right way. And Jesus spells that out here. He says, make disciples, baptising them and teaching them. Both are necessary. Baptism, that symbol of that initial decision to turn to Jesus for forgiveness and to commit to following him. The decision I take, if we go back to our example, that I'm going to follow you to the unknown destination rather than just set out in the vain hope that I might find it. And teaching, that ongoing process of instruction as to how we should continue to live and work out the fullness of that initial decision. Teaching how to obey, it's an ongoing process. There's always more for us to learn. And both are necessary. Baptism without teaching leads to decisionism. The idea that's perhaps more prevalent in the US, but it's certainly not absent here. That if you've once made the decision to follow Jesus, you've prayed a particular prayer perhaps, or you've you've been baptised, or you've signed some sort of pledge, whatever it might be, that you're, you're therefore in. You're a Christian. What you do now doesn't matter. The important thing is that you've claimed the name of Jesus. At the other extreme, if we start to teach people how to obey without their first being a response of faith, a, a recognition of the need for washing and cleansing and renewing in baptism, a recognition that we can never be the people that God wants us to be, then we just end up with a set of rules. We end up with people who know exactly how to behave, but they're trying to do it all as a set of orders without having made that first heart response that that expresses the desire to follow and the need to rely on Jesus to be able to do so. And it very quickly becomes dead and legalistic and impossible. In the same way that we all find it impossible to follow rules which we don't agree with from someone we don't respect. True discipleship requires both. A response from deep within us that expresses our love for Jesus, our desire to follow, our need of him. And then a continual process of learning together more of what that means. What obedience looks like. How we live the commands of Jesus in our lives. How to follow more closely in his footsteps as his disciples. And both these aspects are important to who we are as church. To the commission that Jesus has given us. We must be calling people To faith in Jesus, to confess their need of him, to seek his forgiveness, to give public testimony of their response in baptism, acknowledging that they are going to follow him. And then we must be helping one another to do so. Teaching one another, wrestling with the scriptures, challenging where necessary, encouraging where necessary, seeking his guidance together where the way is not clear and his strength where it is difficult. So that we can grow as disciples. And the good news is, we don't have to do that alone. The command to go and make disciples is preceded by therefore, and that should always, when it comes up in scripture, make us look back 
to what has come before. And in this case, what has come immediately before is all authority in heaven and earth has been given me. What does that mean? It means that Jesus has the power and the authority to commission his disciples in this way. He's giving them what they must do to establish the church, his church, over which he will be the head. He will have authority. And that's true down to us. We are his church, his people. He still has authority in our lives, collectively as his people. He still has authority in the world and he's calling us to call other people to recognise that authority. And with authority comes power. He has the power as the Lord of all, as the ruler of the universe. The one who, having ascended to be at the right hand of the Father, forever lives and reigns. But he's not just a distant authority. He's also the one who promises at the end of our reading today, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The one who comes by his Holy Spirit, who lives in us, who brings us power to dwell in us, brings his power to dwell in us, who fills his church, who gives us all that we need to fulfil this commission which he has given us. His power working through us, giving us the words to say, drawing people to faith, enabling us to grow together in obedience as his disciples. So this is Jesus' last commission. One which is recorded here for us as it's passed down through generations of the church. Because it's our commission too. This is what we are made to be as the people of Jesus. And so I'm going to leave you this morning with two challenges. Firstly, the challenge, are you a disciple of Jesus? And remember, that's not just about having once made a decision, prayed a prayer or even having been baptised. Nor is it about trying to follow an outward set of rules or a code of behaviour that makes it all about obedience. It's about a heartfelt commitment to a journey. A journey following Jesus. Have you begun that journey? If you haven't, there's always space for more disciples. And he calls you this morning to follow him, to recognise his authority, to receive his promise that he will be with you always. And if you'd like to know more about what that means, about the journey you'd be undertaking, about how you can begin to follow him, please do get in touch. My second challenge is to those of us who are his disciples, who are seeking, however imperfectly, to follow in the footsteps of our Lord and Saviour, to learn from him, to obey him. My challenge to you is how committed are you to helping others on that journey of discipleship. How important is it to you to enable others to take that initial step, to step out in faith on the journey? How willing are you to help them along that way, to teach others in the faith, to learn with them, so that we might all follow him more closely? Because that's what we are all called to do, collectively as the church. To be a missional movement, a disciple-making movement, a people on a journey. A journey which is never about us, but always about inviting others to come and share that journey with us. And there's a challenge in that for us collectively too. The lockdown over the past few months has changed things. For individuals, for society, and for the church. Many of us, myself included, are desperately waiting for things to return to normal. And that's understandable. We've lost much that is precious to us, and we long for the time we can have those things returned to us. But there's also a real sense in which things will not be the same after. 
Having had this experience, we have all been changed by it. We will not be the same people. Our society will not be the same. And our church cannot be the same. Don't ask me what the differences will be. I don't know. There's too many books out there already claiming to be the answer to what God is saying or doing through this. And the true prophets of the church are concerned because we need to wait to discern that properly. But some things seem to be happening in this time. Even if it is far too early to suggest this might be some great spiritual turning point. Many more people are turning into online services, tuning into online services than would walk into a church building. Will they come along to physical services when they restart? Some may. Some certainly won't. How do we continue to reach them? Because we must continue. If God is working through this to bring people to a point of realising their need of him, they need to follow him as disciples, then we must be there as the church to enable them to make that decision and to disciple them on that journey. On the other side, some of those who have been regularly in our church for years may decide they prefer worshipping from their own homes and not come back. Some may miss, at the very least, being able to worship at other times which are more convenient to them. Some of you will have seen the meme going round on social media. The family sitting in church listening to the sermon and the thought bubble above the dad's head. It's nice to be back in church, but I am missing the pause and mute functions. Some, many, may return but not find that easy. Friendships have been strained and new friendships have been made. A group of people who lived and worshipped together and had broadly the same aims and objectives before may find themselves having been pulled in different directions in this crisis. Some may find this is their time to seek a new church community. Many who come back to their old church communities won't want to come back to something that's just as it was before. This time has challenged and changed them and they will want the church to be going in new directions. All of that applies to all church communities, not just BBC, but it will apply to BBC. It will be a challenge for us, as much may change. Everything, perhaps, will need to be re-evaluated, priorities and purposes considered. Ministries may have to be done in a different way or cease entirely. New ministries, which have begun in this time, will continue. It's still far too early to say what will change or what will remain the same. What it looks like to make disciples, to call people to commit to Jesus, to teach them has already been changing over recent years with generational change. COVID-19 may have accelerated that, or it may have sent it off in a completely different track entirely. I don't know what form our mission and our ministry, our worship and our service, our being the community of faith, will take in 6, 12, 18 months' time. I suspect, as I say, there will be much that we recognise and much that is different. But I do know that as a church we must remain, or dare I say become, faithful to the commission of Jesus. To be a movement that in whatever way is appropriate to the season we are in, seeks to make disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus. Baptising them and teaching them. All done in his authority, his power, and with his ongoing presence to the end of the age. Amen. Thank you for that message, Phil. There's quite a challenge there, isn't there, to get out there and make Jesus known. Now, as we're coming to the end of our service right now, 
we're going to worship one last time with a song that's really in fitting with that particular message from Phil. But as we lead, as, as we as we finish our service, no matter whether you're in a big family or you're on your own, whether this week has been fantastic or it's been dreadful, if today is just one of those days that you can't cope with, if today is one of those days when you know what's brilliant, if you're celebrating this week, I'm afraid we might not have crunches for you, Grace has eaten one, but I'm sure we'll find others. God bless you in all that you do. Reach out to us if there's anything we can help you with. And we hope to see you at 11.30 for our regular virtual coffee on Zoom. God bless you. Amen. Set your rule and reign in our hearts again.